so what I've been building last couple of years is this concept of exercise books called Incredibly Useful Exercises, which are they're short little micro exercises anywhere from one to five minutes with a couple being 10 minutes. And they focus on conditioning specific aspects of bass playing in short stolen moments. It was so great to reconnect with today's guest. He's been on the podcast before. I've had a chance to hang out with him in person many times over the years, and I just can't say enough good things about him. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Bass Conversations, and we are chatting today with Dennis Whitaker, who is principal bassist of the Houston Grand Opera, bass faculty at the University of Houston, does a bunch of other things, and... What we're talking about today is his new YouTube channel called Incredibly Useful Exercises, and they are certainly that. He's got four of them out now on YouTube as I record this. I've been practicing them, going through them. I've got them on my iPad, up on my music stand, and oh my goodness, what a cool approach to teaching. So Dennis is taking 45 of his favorite exercises and putting them up on YouTube, putting them into 16 volumes. We talk about that. He's got them categorized on a scale of one to five for control, mindfulness, expression, power, velocity, coordination, and endurance. We get into all of that on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate it. We'll have everything linked up. And I just want to say thank you to the folks that have supported this show over the years. Dario Strings, Upton Bass, Modacity, A440 Violin Shop, Colstein Music, Steve Swan String Bass. And I just really appreciate the support they've given this show over the years. If you want to help them get back up and running through this pandemic, uh, we got links in the show notes. So check them out. Consider a purchase, uh, any sort of gear or instrument that you're looking for. This is a great episode today, folks. I really am thrilled to have him back on the podcast. Let's get going with Dennis Whitaker. Hey, Jason. Hey, how's it going, Dennis? <laughs> Uh, it's going awesome. How about you? <laughs> it's it's uh, it, it, interesting times for sure. Um, isn't it crazy? Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Are I, you um, doing all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. You know, my wife's a radiologist, and um, so oh. she's not directly working on the coronavirus or with patients for that or anything, but it's business as usual in the hospital in a lot of ways, so she's still going yeah. to work, and she actually has a letter from the chief of police of San Francisco that she carries with her uh, in case the cops stop or anything, saying she's allowed to be out of the house and wow. move around. Is it is is Houston locked down? Is your area or are you? They're how, going. They're going at midnight tonight. Okay. So us and then uh, I just talked with Kate Jones. Her mm -hmm. county's going under. She says hi, by the way. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, she's uh, th but they're going under lockdown at midnight tonight also. Wow. And it's not lockdown. They're calling it like a shelter in place or stay at yeah. home or work work safe thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's it's going to be interesting. I don't have to carry a letter, but you know, I get to go visit my son, and I, I'm going to go out tonight, take my base out to a sidewalk, and pat, uh, play for the joggers that are running by and the kids, and oh. see if they want to be entertained. Oh, nice! It's that that kind of weather is really good right now. <laughs> oh, wow! That's that's uh, that's great. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, it's be yeah. Fun. We've been we've been sheltered in place all week. I think that happened. Oh. Uh, yeah, like a week ago. So it's been it's been interesting. And then we're moving like right now too, which is are you? Oh no. Yeah. Well, it's okay because we're actually moving just to another place in our same general. We bought a place, and it's like the next building over. It's in the same oh, complex. Good. So I, if I crane my neck to the right here, I can see the new. And so you can see it. Yeah. So the, <laughs> The internet and my desk are at the old place, but we're, we're buying new stuff because it's our first, like, you know, like home home. And so yeah. um, getting it all set up. So I want to be at the new place because it's nicer. Um, but yeah, uh, but I so I come back here for internet stuff and then go there to hang out. And um, so I, I, I'm actually do I was planning on just hanging out at home and setting up the place anyway <laughs> right now. Yeah. So aside uh -huh. aside from the, uh, you know, crazy what if, if I didn't check the new or if I didn't look outside, I'm probably doing what I would have been doing without the pandemic. But it's oh interesting. It, yeah. Yeah. Do you know anybody that's that like personally that's that's uh, that has it that's positive for it? 
Uh, no, but but the the my wife works for University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, and yeah. that's that's sort of been the one of the centers of managing this uh -oh. since it landed. And so they have all these statistics that that they show. So it's very and and outside of the main hospital, it does look like a disaster movie. They have set up all these extra yeah. extra uh, outdoor tents and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know what you call them, but just to handle the right. handle the what what they think is coming um but they jumped so on... it's not that they're full right now they're just anticipating a surge yeah and i mean california jumped on it relatively quickly so now you're if you're looking at new york i mean it's 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 way above what california or washington state uh yeah. are so yeah who knows man it's but and then of course it's like for for um all the people in the music world uh, and service industry and yeah. so many other things but boy to, to look it's at devastating it is deva it is devastating and yeah, yeah. so what yeah. no I'm, it's i'm assuming was the houston grand opera in in season at this point still or had that we we still had the magic flute and salome to do and Ooh. they canceled both of those okay but the the opera is in a position where they're actually going to pay us 50 percent of our service which they did not have to do yeah and they they just set it as a priority that they're going to treat their workers as best as they possibly can. I don't know if it means they're going to dip into their endowment or, or what to cover it. But the fact that they put that as a priority is huge because I know it's not like that in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, Chicago lyric, I think is, is in terrible shape and some of the other companies are. So I'm really grateful that the Houston opera is doing that. So the Houston okay. opera finished at the ballet that, which I don't play in canceled their shows and I don't know what they're doing for the musicians. Okay. Um, the Houston Symphony, same. I think they they gave them a couple of weeks of pay. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's it's terrible. So, and then they canceled the Who concert, which I was really looking forward to. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but there yeah there are musicians I know that are losing up to you know thirty thousand dollars just gone in a week of yeah. work. So it's, it's, uh, it is devastating. I, I don't know how they're going to get out of it. I'm hoping that when it's all finished, that when people start flooding money back into the economy, that we can make it up somehow. But I, I don't know that it's going to be making up for lost work. I think it's just going to be picking it up and going on from here. Yeah. Yeah. So, it is, it is, it is crazy to watch, uh, like the, the flood of people trying to figure out uh, how to, how to do something online, you know? And, right. and, uh -huh. and, and I'm curious about the university of Houston are, are, I miss, uh, do what, have they figured out what they're doing for the rest yeah. of the semester? Okay. They just announced, I think this week that we're doing online the rest of the semester. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, they're doing that, but we've spent, this is what I've been doing the last week is trying to become an IT specialist. So I just, for instance, I just learned today that I can use my iPhone as a webcam Yeah, it's because my, my webcam went out on my computer. So I got that, but we're, we're working through Microsoft teams yep. and we just had a faculty meeting today for an hour where we're discussing all the problems that are coming up and teachers are trying to do synchronous listening assignments, Beethoven symphonies and, you know, the history classes and all, and it's not really working out so well. So there's a lot of problem solving, but then the class, I teach a pedagogy class and I do the lessons and working through Microsoft teams, that seems to be working really well so far. So uh, the private lesson teachers are all getting a really beautiful mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning. Yeah. Um, so for, you know, and I talked with Paul Ellison about this. He's doing kind of the same approach. It's a mixture of all the technology that's available. So student contact is number one. Mm -hmm. Like, like we, a lot of me and my teachers, me and a lot of my teachers who are friends, think are putting student contact as number one. So we're spending a lot of time just talking to the kids, visiting with them online, things like that. Yeah. And uh, so it seems to be going, okay, there's a lot of problems to work out. And then one thing we're trying to do at university of Houston is to figure out some type of website. Uh, we had this weekly recital series where the students would play for the whole student body mm -hmm. and on every Tuesday. And we're trying to come up with a website or something at the university where students who are doing really creative projects right now can upload it for viewing by the whole student body as sort of a mutual um, inspiration, motivation to inspire the kids to do their own creative work. Cause the teachers want to do the creative work too, but still maintain the academic rigor that the kids are paying for. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. So it, anyway, it's, it's just insane right now, but I do like that everybody in the world is focused on one single topic. I've never seen that before. 
Oh, I know. And and I mean, if you look for a uh, try to find some silver lining, uh, that, you know, it's uh, pe- people are going to come out of this with a whole bunch of new skills in, in terms of right? everything. But in terms of in terms of education, for sure. And I can't help but think like I, I was I was chatting with you. It was not long ago on the phone. Yeah. I was in the the Cent- Centurion Lounge at some airport. I don't even remember what. Now I can't even imagine what the airports right. looked like. But that was maybe a month ago. That was ago. after Pittsburgh. Yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah. So, so yeah. So that was lit. That was not even a month ago. We were chatting. Uh, that's right. And, and, that's and, right. And how how ir- ironic might not be the right word, but how that you've been thinking about building up uh, <laughs> you know, resources online has been very much on your mind. So yeah, um, um, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, we could talk about whatever um, for for sure. Right, but right. like, maybe just talk about what you've been building. Well, this, so what I've been building the last couple of years is this concept of exercise books called incredibly useful exercises, which are they're short little micro exercises, anywhere from one to five minutes, with a couple being ten minutes. And they focus on conditioning specific aspects of bass playing in short stolen moments, which were originally meant to be done like, you know, at break during rehearsal or if students only had 15 or 20 minutes to practice between classes, they could get some type of really productive conditioning done in very short amounts of time. Mm -hmm. And I realized this at at University of Houston in, in the city of Houston commuting is such a big part of our life and even for the students life so i i generally commute anywhere from one and a half to four hours a day depending and a lot of the students do the same thing so i've been focusing my energies for the kids practice more and more towards smaller stolen moment exercises and these in- include you know it could be just a short little vomit exercise or a little disco line that goes on for three minutes but um i'm i'm wanting to do a lot of things with the books. And I did have them planned and I was going to be releasing them next month. But now that this has happened, everything's gotten accelerated (laughs) by, you know, by a matter of weeks. So I've been meeting with my uh, producer and he's helped me set up the studio and we got that rush. So that's, this is all ready to go. And the books are going to be still coming out soon after I get some permission from some people who and I'm very excited about the books also. So the it's really in three parts. It's This whole thing is about videos, a website, and books. And it started with the books. And the books started because I wanted to be able to give my students a, a short little handbook and say, read this cover to cover. It takes about an hour, and it's a really good workout. And it's just a set of short little three- and four-minute exercises. It's because there's such a, a, a wealth of information and etude books and method books and all this brilliant stuff that's out there. But kids, it's sort of a tyranny of choices with the kids because I find that they spend a lot of time in their practice just flipping between books and finding the right etude and finding the assignment. And this simplifies it for a lot of them. It's, they turn the page and there's the teaching points and then the exercise on the right they get done with it, go to the next page right away, and you get into a nice little flow where you can you can just you know go cover to cover and be done with it. So if I want the kids to work on their velocity, I give them the velocity book. If they need more help with just mindfulness and settling down, I give them the mindfulness book. And and uh, so it's grown into that. And I'm trying to get get that out also to talk about the idea of uh, conditioning versus learning versus practicing and this is going to be what the website explores and uh so basically i'm trying to get the the idea that there's a difference too between learning practice and conditioning and uh i'm part of my job as a teacher is to help the students transition between those phrases throughout a, phases throughout a semester so learning is just conceptualizing you know as a, a piece you learn a piece you don't have to be at the base to learn a piece you can conceptualize your fingering, your bowing, everything like that. Uh, Learning a box suite, for instance, can take some people months or years, depending on how quickly they can conceptualize the notes and the motions needed. And if the motions are already in their body, then the learning goes much more quickly. Practice is the art of linking the brain to the body, which is matching the conceptualization to the motions that we make and putting it in our muscle memory. And this is why we practice scales, so that we can link our conceptualization to the muscle memory more quickly, and we can put more tools in our toolbox. So over time, after we've learned a piece, if we've done it right, it stays in our muscles. 
we remember the fingerings and the Boeing's combinations and all the uh, coordination needed to play it. But it doesn't mean that two years from now we'll necessarily be able to play it with the same power or endurance that we did when we performed it way back when because because we're out of condition. Mm -hmm. So part of time management in, in the city like Houston where we're talking about for a big deal for both me and my students is that practice takes on a more focused intensity towards conditioning aspect, just getting your muscles strong enough to play. Um, and then it does for learning and practicing because a lot of kids just don't have two or three hours in a row to practice in a city like Houston. So the practicing becomes more of an idea of conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, so, and even for me too, when we did the ring cycle, I knew that I had to be really strong and agile in the lower octave of the fingerboard. So in my short conditioning routines between lessons or as a warm up before the show, I would dismiss exercising in the upper octave of the fingerboard for instance, during the run. So I wanted my body and my left and right hand and every motion I needed to be optimally supported by my support muscles and, you know, my thumb muscles in the right hand. And I needed my fourth finger and my left hand to work way more strongly than my third finger, for instance. So by isolating fourth finger and dismissing conditioning third finger, I got a whole lot more bang for my buck out of time. Mm. And that's a long way to talk about the basic essence of the books. But I, I've seen a lot of good results in my students, and this is what I'm trying to pass on. Oh, I can't wait. I, I remember chatting with you. I don't know if that was like three years ago or something like that. Oh, but a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. But I remember I, I asked you something about warm-up routine or what you do, and you were like, boom, and right. it was so specific. I think I actually – in fact, I did. <laughs> I used that clip in a highlights episode just talking about practice routines. I remember and, that. Yeah, and I just love uh, – I love how your brain works in terms of that. And then I think going back two years ago maybe or something like that, the Suzuki Institute of the Americas. I remember seeing your session yeah. just talking about a uh, bridge repertoire with George Van. And I just, I, I, I can't, I cannot wait to uh, check this out. And I, th as you're describing, I think about how much of my own, I, I love th separating out that, those three, the learning, practicing, and condition, because it is so different, isn't it? Those really are different yeah. modalities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I find that for, High school kids and college kids, they have so much energy in everything that they want to do, but they, they're not exactly sure when to switch modes mm -hmm. because when they realize that they can play a piece, there is a mentality that says, okay, I understand this motion. Now I need to move on to the next one. And my focus is, no, you've got the skill now. It's like a pet. Now you get to nurture it. Now you get to let it grow. And that's, that's the whole miracle of the George Vance method. The reason that works is because we spend our whole lives refining these skills that are given us in book one. Mm -hmm. and, and even when Suzuki, he introduces skills in like violin book two, and he says clearly, uh, I don't expect this motion to be mastered until book nine, <laughs> for wow. instance. You know, And so, so I, I do find that a lot of this has to instill in the students – Switch modes when it's time. When your muscles are ready to play it, you'll know. And then don't quit. Keep going on it. Keep playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for the next 10 years because there's always a way to do it better. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah, talking to Rob but, Rob Knopper. Uh, he's a uh, one of the percussionists in the Met uh, Orchestra, and he was talking about practicing and how it's almost like his hands uh, practicing snare drum uh, exercises. These some of these really complicated things, and how he would almost feel his hands like molding to the music, like <laughs> after a certain time. I just love that that right. that image. I love that. I love that. Yeah. One of one of the uh, formative practice sessions I saw when I was at school at Baylor was a friend of mine practicing snare drum and he practiced a snare drum roll for one hour. And I saw him and I saw him for five minutes. And so I sat down and watched him for an hour and he just, it was that same kind of thing. But after a while for me, I could, I could feel my, the way that I perceived the sound of a snare drum roll got more focused and, uh, and seeing him practice something like that. So steady on the motion was fascinating. I would love to see that article about, about that percussionist in the Met. That's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, no, he's great. Rob Knopper, he runs a site called Audition Hacker. Uh, and and, nice. you know, and so he's got a, a great, great video series about, but I, I did an interview with him Oh, uh, maybe four years ago or something like that about just just his his approach and philosophy to auditioning and i remember him describing that man i right. love i love that you've got videos you've got website you've got books so how is this all t 
taking like like maybe just tell me about those three components so the video is going to be on youtube and then yes within the website too and that are the books digital as well as physical or just tell me about all that you know so the youtube the youtube videos are going to start coming out on thursday okay and the, and i was going to put them out once a week but i think that i think that i want to put out like one every couple of days or so now because i I see people hungry for ideas and I see students with a lot of time on things. So I'm going to use yeah. this time to not only put out videos for the people that need it now, but also to create a library for my students mm -hmm. um, for the future. Cause now any student that comes to study with me, I can say, you know, watch this video on the vomit exercise, watch this on shifting. Yeah. And uh, so they, they have a much better resource for doing that. So the videos are going to be coming out pretty regularly starting on Thursday the the books um, I want to get out soon and honestly I haven't decided about the electronic format because my original vision of it was to have the teaching points on the left and the music on the right mm -hmm. so that that again it's that same point of just revisiting the same skills in the way that a baseball player starts a season just by playing catch yeah. you know that's all they do is they go out and they just throw the ball back and forth and it, it's the same. So every time I visit the vomit exercises, there's always a moment in my mind of affirmation and focus. Why am I doing this? How do I do this? What do I look out for? How do I recover if something goes wrong? So I want to remind myself of that every time I do that. So I approach each exercise with mindfulness. And I can do it on an electronic book, but on an electronic book, you can usually just view one page at a time unless you set it up. So if yeah. I do it with the electronic books, which I think I'm aiming for, then I want to encourage people to set it up with both both pages at the at the um, at the same time. Yeah. And then the website's not going to come out for a month or two, but that's in the process right now with my web designer. Nice, because nice. because um, the the big idea actually that my son gave me was that eventually I want this concept of one hour workouts to be developed on every instrument in the orchestra so yeah, i know that i know vi i've talked with my violin players and friends and saxophone player friends and they all said and i asked them do you have these little exercises that y'all do that aren't really written down that are just passed in lessons just by rote and they all have this collection of these tiny little things that nobody really bothers to write down because you know they're part of our canon they're part of the lexicon but they just not written down or they're stolen from other instruments like we have the clark thumb drills which yeah. is that trumpet exercise basses have the bumblebees which is that cosman cello exercise we've stolen mm -hmm. so i would love on the website to get the you know to eventually branch off to other instruments to have one or two one hour conditioning books on every instrument and that's what i'd like the website to go to but that's not going to be for a few months yet i don't want to get the website out until the videos and the books are really well in the works and then i'm going to examine to see what how people are receiving it if it works for them if it doesn't work for them and then once i start tweaking it then i'll start getting that the website out oh beautiful well, i love that you're getting the videos uh, going going uh so soon and getting getting more rather than less out that makes a lot of sense and yeah I, yeah i can't and and then uh in terms of the books do, do you have an idea how how many books are you envisioning <laughs> right now i have 16 volumes oh my goodness two, i know but but it's it's really just focused i I've, I've chosen 45 of my favorite exercises most of them are created by me mm -hmm. and they're not meant to be virtuoso exercises some of them take a lot of power some take endurance some focus on mindfulness but i found that by it's it really is just like uh machines in a weight room so it's when you go into to condition in a gym you say today i'm going to work on upper body today on lower body today on arms it's really that kind of an exercise routine so so the books do vary and they are very specific so you can do a one hour workout on just mindfulness and you can do a one hour workout just on creating a beautiful tone out of the instrument and listening to all the, the ways that you can change the color and so exercising spending one hour on control and mindfulness and listening and discovery to me is is uh, just as beneficial as it is exercising one hour for power, for instance, or trying to play, you know, Bach more beautifully or Kusevitsky faster, Bottasini faster, whatever. Those things are exciting and they have, you know, they have a lot of virtue, but really if you're in an orchestra, I don't really need to play um, 
you know, Paganini or whatever. Yeah. I really just need to be able to play an A flat in tune and really beautifully. And that takes just as much practice. So there's 16 volumes. And then there's one appendix that I have some primers on because there's some exercises that I think need a lot of focus to develop. And then the last appendix is just all 45 exercises. And then anybody can mix and match however you want to. So that's done in alphabetical order. Each book starts with uh, how to use it. The first thing you see is a set of affirmations where everybody just uh, affirms why you go into music, why you love it, who's helped you get it. The next one is two next page is two minutes of silence. So you get to listen to the silence, focus on it, practice your listening skills and listen, learn how to listen to the sounds and hear sounds without associating them with an object. And I'm actually got a whole video planned on this concept. Adam Neely calls this acousmatic and non-acousmatic, <laughs> the ability to hear a sound without identifying the source of the sound. It's like looking at a cloud without saying, oh, that's a puppy. Oh, that's a dragon, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that takes practice. And then after the silence, so it's affirmation silence, the next is the is a practice on centering your body and on checking within with all your large muscles uh, and from the bottom of your body up to your head and then out to your arms. And it teaches a routine of uh, cycling through your body so that you can check in and locate and release tension on a moment's notice. And all these exercises just take one minute or two minutes, but the more you do them every day, then you just get quicker at locating it. And then, uh, so those three, the affirmation, the silence, and the centering, and then uh, the, all the exercises, and then we bookend the workout, the conditioning routine, with two more minutes of silence, and then another statement of the affirmations. So you frame the practice in the same way that you frame a performance, in the same way that you frame an orchestra concert. It begins and ends with silence. It begins and ends with centering and finding yourself, and then... It creates a process of releasing tension so that you can focus and release the tension in your body during the workout. And one other thing I do in all the exercises uh, that I put throughout the book is I'll put two or three times the word center. So in the middle of the exercise, I actually give you space to locate and release tension in your body before you continue. And the idea behind that is that anytime you're playing any concerto or something else, you can put in the word center into those spots. And I want that word center to be a trigger word to relax, to shrug and get your posture correct. Um, Cause if you don't practice that, you're not going to learn how to do it in the middle of a recital. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the, the general scope of the book, 16 volumes, two appendixes, and then all of the books have that same shape framed with affirmation, silence and centering throughout. Well, I, I think of, as you're describing this, I'm thinking of how many times in my life I've been working out of some older book uh, yeah, or, any, or even relatively recent book and think, thinking, man, I wish there was a user manual <laughs> for this. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and it seems like that's kind of what you're, you, I, I just love. It, it seems like such a, a guy. I can't wait to go through these and, and just experience how, what you're describing and guiding people through that. And, and yeah, d having the intentionality baked into that. I love having the one page with the the teaching points and then the the exercises on the right that's that's great yeah. wow you have must you, you must have been working on this for quite some time it's it's been a long time <laughs> and i do need to say too that that when you in our first interview where you asked me about the practice mm -hmm. that i have a lot of seeds for how this thing came around and that question was actually one of those oh wow because i'd never really thought about talking about those those time frames of practice before, but you know, but there were there were a few of these that really inspired the books. One of the there were uh, two big things that really helped coalesce it. You know, teaching public school, you know, uh, the concept of a sponge activity is an activity that's just used to suck up time. So it's putting a worksheet on the kids' stands as they're walking into the beginning of class so that they sit down there immediately on task mm -hmm. and going th and uh, doing things right away. And then teaching in a public school orchestra, you have to find ways to keep your bass players on task while the violins are learning the Paco Bell Canon. So it, and teaching public school orchestra became all about being very efficient and, you know, giving kids um, ways to be beneficial with short stolen moments. That was the first one. And then I remember uh, Max Demoff, when he won the principal of Cleveland, 
he won that job when he had two babies. <laughs> and he said that he he would he doesn't believe that he would have won that job if he didn't have the two kids because the kids really only gave him about 60 or 90 minutes a day to practice spread out throughout the day so he had to be very intentional with his practice so he would when he was carrying around the kids he'd think okay i've got 30 minutes i'm going to do a b c d e and then he would go into it and then do it and then go back to the kids again and that stuck with me for going into practice with a purpose and it really did teach me that you know sometimes shorter amounts of time with more intense practice is way more beneficial than a lot of time where you're just piddling around wow but yeah but your question about that is was one of the last things to help coalesce this whole idea so thank you for that <laughs> small world I love, <laughs> and you know i remember talking with max dimoff also about that efficiency of practice and yeah th though at, right here you know as it was Mar i'm trying to say the date on some of these conversations since they're so specific march 24th 2020 wow. you know we we find yeah. our, we find ourselves with a, a a lot more time on our hands in general we want to be using our time as efficiently as possible. And so I just, I, 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 yeah. and I can't think of how many moments like you're describing with your university of Houston students or, you know, my students that I've had over the years or me when I, you know, uh, just how, how in, how many of those moments where you really only have 20 minutes, you know, what can you do right. that, that right. really, you know, like to maximize those moments. So I applaud you on this. I can't, I cannot wait to check out the videos and the, the books when they come out and, the uh, and the website, when that all comes together, it's really exciting. And, you know, you, you, you've had such a, uh, uh, interesting career in these multiple areas and have been, I, I just, I, th I think you're a great model for, for people just looking at how, how to succeed in different areas in the, in the music world with your past, you know, public teaching and then uh, public school teaching and then your university of Houston and the uh, Houston grand opera. And then uh, just your passion for, for teaching and now what you're doing uh, w with these books and the videos. I just think it's really, really exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate yeah. that. I, yeah. I was talking to, I've been talking to a lot of people about this because I had this really nice article in the opera magazine. Yeah. And that was the whole takeaway from that is there is no career path for us. Mm -hmm. There's no, I've known people that go into the petroleum industry here in, in Houston and they get recruited right out of college and every day in their job is a career path towards a specific goal of project manager, team manager, whatever. And they climb that ladder. Musicians don't have that. We're, right. we're all making it up as we go. Yeah. And this nothing highlights that more than what we're going through right now. There's no rules for musicians right now. We can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. That means a lot to me. Oh, you bet. Well, let's, uh, I, I'm so glad I, it's been far too long since I, since we chatted, I would, right. at any time that this show, I, I, I'm trying to think of this show, like the tonight show or something like that, or before the pandemic, you know, when we could, right, right. Know, uh -huh. but, but, but like, I, I'd love, I'd love to chat, uh, any other time about this, about the books, when the website comes out, anything you got coming up, I've had people on, I think seven or maybe even eight times it might be the record at this point so let's uh wow. let's let's have it not be three years uh yeah and... <laughs> i would love that i would love that thank you so much jason dennis thank you so much folks you got to check these out they are super useful. The name is absolutely accurate, incredibly useful exercises. So check them out. They're linked up in the show notes. And yeah, we got to get Dennis back on the podcast more often. What a great and inspiring person. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I am enjoying doing this from my home, not on the road so much like you probably are as well. I would love to hear from you and how you're doing. I'm sure life is challenging right now for you. It is for everybody I'm talking to, me included. My big struggle these days is just feeling uh caged up, cooped up in the house. It's something that I struggle with uh, regularly. And I do work from home a lot, so that's not new. But I am on the road a lot too, so that has been eliminated for the next uh, chunk of time as have gigs and I'm preaching to the choir here. So, But I would love to hear from you. How are you doing? If you want to stay in touch, 
and not just through the podcast, but through email. Our email newsletter has grown radically <laughs> since we launched it a few years ago. And it, I, I love uh, hearing from people through that. I get responses every single day from the emails we send out. We do talk a bit about the podcast, but much more beyond that. And we have some cool new projects that I can't wait to tell you about, but I'm not going to tell you about it today. But you'll hear them certainly on the podcast, but even sooner on the email list. So join up there, ContraBaseConversations.com or DoubleBaseBlog.org. And by the way, speaking of DoubleBaseBlog.org, now that I'm not on the road so much, I've been trying to, and succeeding largely, putting out a new blog post every week about something that's hopefully helpful related to COVID-19, related to teaching online, related to coming up with your routine in this new world, that sort of thing. I'm trying to put it on an accompanying YouTube video also. That channel has also been growing. So if you spend time on YouTube, which I'm sure you do, you can follow along there. And that's all linked up at the website, ContraBaseConversations.com. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you for listening. And thank you to the team, Michael Cooper, Steve Henschey, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, and Trevor Jones. Mitch is in Kilgore, Texas, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, not too far from there. Makes beautiful bases. He's working on a couple new ones. So check him out at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath. We are still here. We're still going. We're not going anywhere. So thank you for being with us on this journey. We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Thank you.